Good morning and welcome everyone to Bread of Life, Deaf Lutheran Church, our worship service online. My name is Michelle Lewis and I'm the pastor here at Bread of Life. My name is Dorothy Sparks. I'm a deacon here at Bread of Life. I'm David Evans. I'm the sign language interpreter today. We're so glad that you are here and joining us in worship. Um, we, we confess that God is the one who gathers us together and that we do not come by mistake, but that God brings us here to this experience and that God is leading us, getting us ready to go out into the world and share the goodness and the good news of God's love. So to remind ourselves that even though we are separated in our own homes and not all together in one place, we light a candle. We light that candle to remind ourselves that we are gathered together in the light of Christ. That we are not alone, that through the power of God and God's love, we don't understand it, it's a mystery, and still we are gathered, we are together through God. And so at this time, I'll light a candle here, and I invite you at home to light a candle in your homes as well, to remember that we, you're not alone, that we are community, we are drawn together through the power of God and God's love. As we enter into worship, I invite you to just take a moment or two and focus on the candle flame, whether it's this one here with us or the one in your home. Use this opportunity to take a little deep breaths. And enter into worship together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, move, swirl, and dance among us. Remind us that you are always present, encouraging and drawing us in, inspiring us to be the loving people you created us to be. Stir us during this time together to walk humbly, embrace love, and do justice in our unjust and fragmented world. Mm -hmm. Reading from 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 through 13.
what if I could speak all the languages of humans and angels? But if I did not love others, I would be nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What if I could prophesy and understand all secrets and have all knowledge? And what if I had faith that moved mountains? I would still be nothing unless I loved others. What if I gave away all that I owned and let myself be burned alive so that I could brag? I would gain nothing unless I loved others. Love is kind and patient, never jealous boastful, proud, or rude. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices in the truth, but not in evil. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never fails. Everyone who prophesies will stop, and unknown languages will no longer be spoken. All that we know will be forgotten. We don't know everything and our prophecies and our prophecies are not complete. But what is perfect will someday appear and what isn't perfect will then disappear. When we were children, we thought and reasoned as children do. But when we grew up, we quit our childish ways. Now all we can see of God is like a cloudy picture in a mirror. Later, we will see him face to face. We don't know everything, but then we will. Just as God completely understands us. For now, there are faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Beloved friends, as we await and strive for God's vision being fulfilled, faith, hope, and love are with us. And the greatest of these gifts is love. You are love.
All right. So again, as I've been practicing, trying to identify what is my point, where am I going? Um, what's the direction of my sermon? Today, uh, my point is this, that God's love transforms our everyday experiences. God's love can lift up our experiences and change them they, to help them go beyond our own needs. God's love expands our perspective. And God's love allows us to live for others. God's love allows us to give up our own benefits, to help and restore those who are downtrodden and oppressed. That is what God's love does for us. All right. So often the Bible text we have for today, 1 Corinthians 13, often this is thought of as the wedding text. Because when we go to weddings, we will frequently know this text is often used at weddings to inspire the couple with the power and persistence of love. But a couple is not the intended audience for this message. Instead, it is our life together in community that is the target audience. Because as hard as it is for two people to live together and get along and accept each other and love one another, it is compounded significantly in a group of people. A bunch of us who, until we go into a church building or until we enter a faith community, we're strangers. So the Apostle Paul writes to a community about the power and the persistence of God's love. Because throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is offering correction and instructions to the church in Corinth about what it means to be followers of Jesus. And at times, Paul is harsh. Because the church in Corinth has some very bad habits that are breaking their community apart. The people who are part of that congregation who have a lot of money and resources, they're quite content with their own situations. And there are others in their congregation who don't have resources and they're left to fend for themselves. So the congregation turns into separate groups, people who have and people who don't have. And this division influences their life in worship together. And one example is when the community celebrates a meal together, when they celebrate the Lord's Supper. The people who have resources are able to get there early and they're able to have everything ready when they get there. And they just start. They start eating and they eat until they're full and they don't wait for everyone to get there. So the people who struggle to make ends meet, who are working until the last minute and then they go, 
it's a bit like showing up at the end of a potluck. There's like one bun left. So that weird sandwich topping stuff that's there is left and maybe some yucky looking tomatoes or wilty lettuce at the bottom of the bowl. It's a bit like that. Except this is worship. It isn't a potluck. It's the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And the community celebrates that differently because some people have money and some people don't. So you see, the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth offering correction and direction. Don't do that. Paul states this firmly to the church. He calls out their bad behavior and the sins of the community. And then he says, this is what you need to do. And when Paul was writing, letters to churches were often read aloud. So the writer uses a visual, many different visuals, to help us understand the theological concepts that Paul is emphasizing. So in chapter 12, Paul talks about the many, many gifts that God gives comparing how those different gifts work together in community. Paul compares that to how the body has many different parts and how all of those parts work together in the body. And then at the end of chapter 12, Paul teaches how that concept of many parts in the, uh, many different gifts from the Holy Spirit and many parts of the body, they work together. It's an image for how our churches can work together. This is a, a translation of what Paul said, the way God designed our bodies gives us an example understanding our lives together as a church. Every part of the body is dependent, dependent on every other part. There are different parts of our body that we mention and parts that we don't. There are parts that we see and there are parts that are hidden. In our bodies, if one part hurts, every other part is involved in that pain. And if one part is healed, every other part of the body experiences healing. If one part flourishes, then the whole body joins in that joy. So that visual image that Paul uses of our church coming together and depending on every other part in our church, just like how our bodies come together and work together, our, the body parts all come together and work together, that leads us into chapter 13 about love. Because Paul proclaims that the only way we can come together in community 
is through the power and persistence of God's love. Because God's love transforms our everyday, ordinary experiences. It lifts them to go beyond just ourselves. God's love allows us to see new perspectives. And God's love empowers us to say, I need to give up some of my benefits so that others can be lifted up and know they are loved and cherished too. And this is the kind of love, God's love is the kind of love we have to depend on as we all do the challenging and difficult work of learning how we are shaped and formed by racism and racist systems. Because here in the United States in particular, those of us who have light colored skin, we benefit from racism. And racism says that people who have dark colored skin are less. And we follow Jesus. Jesus gave up his life so that we could know that God loves us. The one we follow gave up the benefits of being God to come and be with us. So that means we are called to give up benefits that we get so that others know their love. So, David helped me be a better preacher today <laughs> because he said, you got some really nice sounding sentences here. They don't mean anything. What do you mean? So I'm going to give a couple of examples because it's really, that's what we need. How do we do this work? How do we give up benefits so that others are lifted up? So four years ago, a man named Philando Castillo was stopped um, at a stoplight by the police. And in, uh, it was 90 seconds, I believe, that he was killed. Now, Philando Castile had been stopped repeatedly for small issues. He had a, you know, a tail light was out, or maybe his bumper was kind of broken. Or, I don't know, maybe his muffler needed to be fixed. So for those of us who can hear, a muffler that's broken is really, really noisy. In, uh, from 2002 until 2016, Orlando Castile was pulled over 46 times. for silly little things like that. I, myself, I've been driving around in one of my cars with a broken taillight for about a year. I haven't been pulled over and I drive pretty fast. I haven't been pulled over 
So how do I give up my benefits of that kind of privilege? I need to contact the police and say, hey, if you're going to pull somebody over for having a broken tail leg, you need to pull everyone over for a broken tail leg. That wouldn't be good for me. I would have to adjust my driving quite a lot. Right? But if I did that, it's me giving up my benefits to help someone like Philando Castile, who is harassed and pulled over by the police again and again and again. Of course, it's not just Philando Castile. We know people who have black and brown skin experience this targeting again and again. So as people who follow Jesus, we're called to live like Jesus lived. That means we give up our own benefits for our neighbors. It also means that we use our position to make space and time for others to share their experiences. So what does that mean? I have another example to share with you. So you may know that recently, Deacon Dorothy and I have worked with a group of other churches, and there are a number of us in the planning group. And uh, in June, we had a full week of camp. It was online. We'd meet every day in Zoom, and kids would come together, and then we would, after the kids left, we would sort of talk about how did the day go. And one day, we were talking about how what was the process like? Um, as we consider the children who are there who are deaf and their families and what was it like for them. And Dorothy and I were, were there and pretty quick other people started talking. They, they didn't wait for Dorothy or for me to talk about what we observed. And so Pastor Brenda who is the pastor at Bethel Lutheran Church. She said, wait, wait, wait. Let's listen to Dorothy. Let's listen to Michelle. They have the experience. They can help us learn. So Brenda used her position and her power in that group to say, wait, let's allow Dorothy, give her time to, to speak and share her experience. Let's listen to what Michelle has learned in the time that she's been at Bread of Life. Now, Brenda knows a little bit about what it's like to interact with the deaf community because she's been learning. So Brenda could have spoken herself, but she said, no, no, no. I'm going to say, Dorothy, please tell us what it was like. Michelle, what do you see? So Brenda used her power to make space and time for Dorothy and me. So it's not like these aren't really, really hard things for us to do. But it takes a little bit of courage to speak up among your friends, to contact the police and say, hey, I do this wrong all the time. To confess that I do things wrong. 
and ask to be held accountable for it, that takes courage. And today's lesson helps us know that as we take these steps, God's love is there supporting us. It is underneath us. It is all around us. And that even when we give up some of our benefits, there will still be enough. There still would be enough. And there are lots of ways to start to learn about our, our own racism. There are lots and lots of ways to do that. And it seems to me one of the critical ways is to learn about others' struggles. There are more stories coming out in the newspaper. There are books that are written. There are movies that tell these stories so we can learn about others' lives. And I think the challenge really is to believe their stories. As often as we learn those stories, unbelievable things happening So as you find yourself saying, I can't believe that, that's not true, that didn't happen. Stop yourself and say, I must believe this. And again, I have an example because it's always helpful to have an example of how does this show up in our lives? So in mid-June, our family started a Friday night movie night with some friends. We changed our garage into sort of a movie theater. We hung up a white sheet on the wall and projected the movie up. And the first movie we watched is called Just Mercy. This is the story of a Harvard-educated attorney. He is a black man, and he chose to move to Alabama because there are many people in Alabama on death row who are wrongly convicted. The main character in the story is named Brian Stevenson. And it's a true story. Brian is still doing this work, fighting for justice for people who are wrongly convicted. And most of those people are black men in the United States. So there's a lot of different things in the movie that happened, but in one scene, I found myself sort of going, I can't believe this. The attorney went to visit his clients in prison. And in order to go in, he had to do, they did a strip search of him. This is highly improper. So I found myself as I watched the movie wanting to somehow make it okay. And so I said to myself, well, this is 30 years ago. It was in the deep South in Alabama. It was a high security prison. I mean, it was death row. And at the same time, I sort of felt ashamed of how ignorant I was. Because the story happened 
when I was a senior in high school, there were supreme, big Supreme Court decisions that freed people from death row. I knew nothing about it. During the movie, my kid said, hey, Mom, did you know about this? No, I didn't know. And then the next day, after we watched this movie, I read an article in the Star Tribune paper here in Minneapolis related to the murder of George Floyd. When the police officer who killed George Floyd was arrested and taken to Ram Ramsey County Jail, the jail manager decided that any jail officers uh, who were people of color could not be on the same floor as, the, as that police officer. In addition, to that, just in addition to that, a white jail officer went into the cell of the police officer, not proper, and then allowed him to use her cell phone, not proper. This improper behavior happened in Minnesota, in a county jail, in June of 2020. So as we learn these stories of black and brown and indigenous people, We have to prepare ourselves for heartbreak. We must believe these stories. It's so important. And it is hard work. I think it's probably harder for me because I live in a life of privilege. You all have experienced this in ways that I haven't. And still, we all, we all must be grounded in God's love. We have to know that we are loved. Because the only way that we as a community can confess our mistakes and our sins is through confidence that God loves us. Because God's love transforms our ordinary, everyday experiences. God's love allows our experiences to be lifted up for others. God's love allows us to give up our benefits so that other people who are oppressed and downtrodden can know and experience that God loves them. To know that I am praying for you this week, that you will notice those stories that make you say, I can't believe that. And that you try and you believe those stories. And I'm praying for you this week, that you know, that you experience that your whole body realizes that God loves you.
prayer for racial justice. Save us, God, from ourselves. When we fear to confess, from racism covered up with nice words. From the lies of white supremacy that are hidden. From microaggressions thinly veiled in arrogance. from apologies when they don't give way to action. From forgiveness without facing the truth. from reconciliation without reparations. God, deliver us. Deliver us, O oh God. When we expect our siblings of color to keep doing our emotional work, We are grateful for the long arc that bends toward justice. We pray, grant us wisdom. Give us courage for the facing of these days. By the power of the Spirit, for the sake of the kingdom, we share in Christ Jesus. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. At this time, please share a sign of God's peace with one another. If you're um, sitting next to someone in your home or send a text message or write an email quick. And um, or maybe a little bit later, you write a note of card or postcard and send that to someone to share the peace of God with one another. It's really important for us to take a couple minutes to do this every, whenever we have the opportunity, really, because we're all um, still separated and not sure when we'll be back together in person. So take a, take a moment to reach out to someone and wish them peace. And similarly, we get to the point in our service where we um, ask for our offerings. And our offerings uh, to God are many, many things. Um, our gifts and talents. Maybe you're a woodworker and you enjoy um, creating things with wood. Maybe you know how to sew and you're making face masks at this point in time, right? Maybe you are a cook and you love to make good tasty food and you're feeding um, people in your home and maybe your neighbors who are making food for them, right? Those are all offerings that we give to God's glory. We also give some of our money. We share some of our money with the work that God is doing in the world and God is working through us here at Bread of Life. God calls us to share the good news that God loves us. And we share that good news with a particular group of people, with deaf people and their families. God calls us to share the good news with deaf people and their families. So that's what we're doing. And we ask you to join in that work and to offer some financial support for that. 
come because we are still working. We are not gathering in our building at this time because we want to keep one another safe and not spread the virus to one another until we have more information about how to treat it and if there's a vaccine that we come up with, those kinds of things. And so for the time being, we're meeting here online. But we're still doing the work that God calls us to do. So we ask at this time that you prepare your offerings to send the bread of life. In our prayers for blessings for the world, Holy One, in Creator, in Christ, in the Spirit, you have given yourself to us. Now we give back to you. This money that seems so little, this worship that seems so small. These words that never quite get it right. Receive what we offer. And transform it by the power of your spirit. Transform it into enough money, plenty of praise, honest words that proclaim and enact your peace, your justice, and your love in the world. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for unity in the world. Holy Spirit, kindle in us your holy fire. Give us confidence of your unfailing presence. May we turn to you for hope in times of uncertainty and loss. Today, we pray for your comfort for the family of Philando Castile, who was killed by police four years ago. Teach us to live as the body of Jesus in the world, that we will be people who pray and learn, people who share life together and love our neighbors, people who work for justice, worship together, people who break bread together and share good news, God's love. Help us to rest in you and grow in the Holy Spirit. So God, we pray that you unite, that you will unite the world through our common prayers for peace and understanding. And now send us out with your love. Help us to depend on you and restore and renew the beloved community of the whole world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
now receive the blessing. As you go this week, know, know this. God's Holy Spirit is our advocate. Sent from God in Christ's name. And now may the Holy Spirit teach you and remind you of Jesus' words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. For the peace of Christ and the Holy Spirit is with you always. God gathers us together and God sends us out into the world. So as you are sent, remember this. Jesus commands us to come out. And changes our life from dark caves of struggle to live full life in the brightness of a new joy. So go out. We are God's resurrected people. We go out with God's holy breath.